Join me in collaboration with Wolf Hall Weekend next June at Cat Hay House in Devon. Book now to experience the literary event of the year in celebration of Dame Hilary Mantle's multi-award winning Wolf Hall Trilogy. Join a weekend of personal tributes, expert talks, celebrity readings, interactive workshops, literary and historical reviews, and good food in the enchanting period location of Cat Hay House in East Devon, a favorite location of Hillary's close to her home. This is a unique and immersive event where many of Hillary's friends and colleagues will honor her memory and share their experiences in helping to bring her literary genius to the world through books, stage, and screen. Historical experts will shed additional light on the turbulent world of Thomas Cromwell, and literary experts will explore Hillary's imaginary interpretation of Cromwell that works its magic on her readers. This is a limited capacity event, so make sure you book early to secure a place. You'll find a link in the show notes. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to This Week in Royal History, where we take a look at the captivating stories of royals from around the world, across various centuries, and explore the impact that they had on history and society. Through their triumphs and tragedies, these royals shape the world we live in today, leaving behind legacies that continue to inspire and intrigue us. Anne Neville, born on the 11th of June, 1456, had quite a dramatic life. Her father, Richard Neville, the 16th Earl of Warwick, was a powerful figure in England known as the Kingmaker. He played a significant role in supporting the House of York during the tumultuous period of the Wars of the Roses. In 1461, Anne's father helped Edward IV ascend to the throne of England. Additionally, Anne's older sister, Isabel, married Edward's brother, George, Duke of Clarence, in 1469. However, things took a turn when her father changed his allegiance to the Lancastrians in 1470. Fleeing to France with his daughters and son-in-law, he joined forces with Margaret of Anjou, the exiled Queen Consort of England. Anne's life took a pivotal turn when she married Edward of Westminster the son of Margaret of Anjou and the imprisoned King Henry VI. At the time of their marriage, Anne's father had already restored Henry VI to the throne. However, this restoration was short-lived. Tragically, Anne's father was killed in battle in April 1471, and King Henry VI was taken prisoner and died the following month. Anne, along with her husband Prince Edward and his mother Margaret of Anjou, found themselves in England gathering troops to fight against Edward IV and the Yorkist forces. Sadly, Prince Edward was killed at the Battle of Tewkesbury. Anne married Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who was the younger brother of Edward IV and George, Duke of Clarence. He would later become King Richard III. Between 1473 and 1476, she gave birth to a son named Edward. In April 1483, Edward IV passed away, and Richard became the Lord Protector of his 12-year-old nephew, Edward V. Anne's brother-in-law, George, had already died in 1478. The situation took a dark turn in June 1483 when Edward V and his siblings were declared illegitimate, and Richard claimed the throne as Richard III. Anne and Richard were jointly crowned on the 6th of July 1483, becoming king and queen of England. But tragedy struck when Anne's beloved son Edward died in April 1484, deeply affecting her. Anne Neville died on the 16th of March 1485, just five months before her husband's fateful battle at Bosworth. 
though her time on earth was filled with political turmoil, family alliances, and personal losses, Anne left a mark on history as a strong and resilient woman. On the 11th of June, 1509, Catherine of Aragon married her second husband, Henry VIII of England. The wedding took place seven years after the death of her first husband, Arthur, Prince of Wales, Henry's older brother. Henry had only been king for two months after the death of his father, Henry VII, and he and Catherine were jointly crowned on the 24th of June, 1509, at Westminster Abbey. Catherine became pregnant at least six times, however, only one child survived to adulthood, the future Mary I of England. The couple were married for 24 years before Henry had the marriage annulled so he could marry Anne Boleyn. Marie de Guise was born on the 22nd of November, 1515, in France, and was the eldest of 11 children born to Claude, Duke of Guise, and Antoinette of Bourbon. Her birth marked the beginning of a life that would intertwine with the political dynamics of Europe. At the age of 19, Marie married Louis II de Orleans, Duke of Longueville, in 1534. Sadly, their union was cut short when Louis passed away just three years later, leaving behind two sons, one of whom died in infancy. Despite her grief, Marie's life took a momentous turn when she received marriage proposals from two prominent rulers, Henry VIII of England and James V of Scotland. Seeking to forge an alliance, both Henry and James were vying for Marie's hand in marriage. Ultimately, it was James V of Scotland who won her heart, and on the 18th of June, 1538, they exchanged vows at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Scotland. The marriage of Marie de Guise and James V of Scotland bore fruit as they welcomed two sons into the world in 1540 and 41. However, when both infant sons passed away within hours of each other, the couple were devastated. But just a year later, in December 1542, Marie gave birth to a daughter who would change the course of history, Mary who would later be known as Mary, Queen of Scots. With the untimely death of James V just six days after Mary's birth, Marie found herself thrust into a position of power and influence. Competing against James Hamilton, Earl of Arran, who was negotiating a marriage between young Mary and Edward, Prince of Wales, the son of Henry VIII, Marie firmly rejected the proposed alliance. As regent, Marie's determination to strengthen Catholic support in Scotland led her to send Mary to France in 1548, where she would be groomed for marriage to the Dauphin Francis when they came of age. Meanwhile, Marie faced numerous challenges from Protestant nobles who opposed her regency. Marie de Guise's tenure as regent was marked by relentless struggles against these Protestant nobles and she sought to uphold Catholic influence in Scotland. Her unwavering commitment to her cause shaped the political landscape of the time. On the 11th of June, 1560, at the age of 45, Marie de Guise passed away. Her body remained in Scotland for several months, wrapped in lead before being transported to France to her final resting place. Ethelfled, believed to be born around 870, was the eldest child of Alfred the Great, the renowned King of Wessex. This was a tumultuous time in England, as Viking invasions were at their peak. By the year 878, much of the country had fallen under Danish rule. In the mid-1880s, Ethelfled entered into a strategic alliance by marrying Ethelred, Lord of the Mercians. The Union aimed to strengthen the ties between Wessex and Mercia, paving the way for joint efforts against the Viking invaders. Their partnership would prove to be a crucial turning point in the ongoing conflict. Over the following years, Ethelfled, along with her husband, led the forces of Wessex and Mercia in a series of battles against the Vikings, reclaiming territory within the Dane law. Their military campaigns resulted in decisive victories and shifted the balance of power in the region. 
But in 911, Ethelred passed away, leaving Ethelfled to rule as Lady of the Mercians in her own right. Her position as a female ruler in Mercia was a rarity in early English history and was regarded as one of the most unique events of the time. Ethelfled utilized her newfound authority to fortify towns and cities in Mercia, bolstering their defenses against future Viking incursions. In 917, her forces achieved a significant triumph by capturing Darby, a stronghold of the Danelaw. As her campaign continued, Ethelfled's army also secured the fall of Leicester, another important Danelaw borough. The success caught the attention of Viking leaders, who extended an invitation for her to meet with them in York. But unfortunately, fate had a different plan. On the 12th of June, 918, Ethelfled died, just before the anticipated meeting. Her legacy as a formidable leader in a time of turmoil would forever be remembered. On the 14th of June, 1381, the Tower of London was besieged by a peasant force who met no resistance when they entered the gates. 14-year-old King Richard II fled to the tower days before when the revolt entered London, but left on the 14th to meet with the rebellion leader at another location in London. The peasants looted the jewel house and beheaded the Archbishop of Canterbury on Tower Hill. This is the only time the Tower of London's defenses failed in its 1,000-year history. After years of unsuccessful foreign policies and heavy taxation, the unpopular King John of England was forced to accept the Magna Carta on the 15th of June, 1215. The Magna Carta, or Great Charter, created a rule of law for all England sovereigns, current and future, that was set by some of the most powerful barons in England. It was successful at first, and revisions were issued in 1216, 1217, and 1225. The rebellion American colonists used the Magna Carta as inspiration for the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution in the revolution against the English crown in the late 18th century. Four original copies still exist today of the Magna Carta, one in Lincoln Cathedral, one in Salisbury Cathedral, and two at the British Museum. Edward of Woodstock, also known as the Black Prince, was born on the 15th of June, 1330, at Woodstock Palace in England. He was the eldest son of Edward III of England and Philippa of Hainault. In 1337, he was created the Duke of Cornwall, the first duchy in English history, and in 1343, he became Prince of Wales. Edward was a prominent military figure during the Hundred Years' War against France as well. In October 1361, at 31 years old, Edward married his cousin, Joan of Kent, who was 33 years old and a widow with three children. Edward was godfather to her eldest son, Thomas. In 1362, his father granted him the territories of Aquitaine and Gascony in France, and Edward and his family moved to the French domains. Edward led an expedition into Spain in 1367 to help restore Peter of Castile to the throne. During this time, he contracted a disease, most likely dysentery, that affected him the rest of his life. In January 1371, he returned to England on the advice of his doctor, and he died in 1376. Interesting fact, Edward's title, Black Prince, was not used until after his death and refers to the armor that he wore. Henry Fitzroy was born on the 15th of June, 1519, as the illegitimate son of Henry VIII of England and his mistress, Bessie Blount. He was recognized by his father, and his surname, Fitzroy, means son of the king. At six years old, Henry was created Duke of Richmond and Somerset, as well as a Knight of the Garter and Lord High Admiral of England. In 1529, Henry was also made Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, 
perhaps with the hopes of granting him the kingdom when he was older. Henry married Lady Mary Howard, a cousin of Anne Boleyn in 1533, and also the daughter of Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk. But Henry Fitzroy died suddenly on the 23rd of July, 1536, at St. James's Palace. His tomb is located at St. Michael's Church in Suffolk, the burial site for the Howard family. Elizabeth Knowles was born on the 15th of June, 1549, to Sir Francis Knowles and Catherine Carey in England. Her maternal grandmother was Mary Boleyn, sister to Queen Consort Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth went to court in 1558, shortly after Queen Elizabeth I took the throne and became maid of honor to her cousin the Queen. In 1566, she was appointed gentleman of in 1566, she was appointed gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber. Elizabeth married Sir Thomas Layton in 1578. Her husband held the office of Governor of Jersey and Guernsey, and she rarely traveled to the islands as she preferred court life. Elizabeth and Thomas had three children, two daughters and one son. Elizabeth died in 1605 at the age of 56. Her elder sister, Latisse Knowles, suffered the wrath of Queen Elizabeth when she married the Queen's favorite, Robert Dudley, and was banished from court. However, this seemed to have no effect on the Queen's attitude toward Elizabeth or her other sisters at court. John de la Pole was born about 1430 as the eldest son of John de la Pole, second Duke of Suffolk, and Elizabeth of York, a daughter of Richard Plantagenet, 3rd Duke of York, and Cecily Neville. His uncles included Edward IV and Richard III of England. In 1467, he was created Earl of Lincoln by Edward IV. John reconciled with the new King Henry VII in 1485 after Richard III was defeated. However, by 1487, he was plotting against Henry in a Yorkist rebellion, claiming a boy named Lambert Simnel was his first cousin Edward, Earl of Warwick, and attempting to put him on the throne. He died on the 16th of June, 1487, at the Battle of Stoke Field, and the Yorkist army was defeated. Edward Plantagenet was born on the 17th of June, 1239, to Henry III of England in Eleanor of Provence, at the Palace of Westminster, in 1254, he married 13-year-old Eleanor of Castile, and they would have at least 14 children, although only five daughters and one son would live to adulthood. Edward joined the Ninth Crusade in 1271, and it was while he was on his way back to England in 1272 that he was informed of his father's death and his accession to the throne. He took his time getting back to England and finally arrived in August 1274 for his coronation. In late 1282, Edward defeated rebel factions in Wales and subjected Wales to English rule. He built a series of towns and settled them with English people to acclimate the Welsh. His wife, Eleanor, died in November 1290 while accompanying Edward on a journey to Lincoln. Edward was deeply affected by his wife's death, but remarried in 1299 at 60 years old to Margaret of France, who was around 20 years old. With his second wife, he had three additional children. After his victory over the Welsh, Edward began to look north into Scotland, wanting to unite the whole of Britain under one rule. The Scots resisted, and he met William Wallace in various battles between 1298 and 1304. Edward died on the 7th of June, 1307, on his way back to Scotland. He's buried at Westminster Abbey. Edward has the nickname Edward Longshanks, he was six foot two, and Hammer of the Scots. It was on the 17th of June, 1567, that Mary, Queen of Scots, was imprisoned at Loch Leven Castle in Scotland after surrendering to Protestant nobles who opposed her marriage to the Earl of Bothwell. Just over a month later, she abdicated the throne in favor of her one-year-old son, James VI. 
Mary escaped from Loch in May 1568 and traveled to England, where she found herself once again a prisoner, but this time under her cousin, Elizabeth I of England. And that concludes this week's episode of This Week in Royal History. I'd like to give a special shout out to two new patrons, Joyce M. and Olivia H. Thank you so much, Joyce and Olivia, and thank you to all of my existing patrons as well. If you'd like to become a patron and get access to commercial-free episodes and so much more, check us out over on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash tutorsdynasty for more information. I'm Rebecca Larson. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.